To fully understand the present, we must understand the past. And one thing I see time and time again is people misunderstanding elements of the past, which is bad because it leads to false conclusions, which in turn leads to horrible and needless suffering. One of my patrons, John Hargreaves, recently asked me a question regarding Hitler and National Socialism. He said, I am a naive scientist and engineer with an interest in all things about people and what drives them. Therefore, may I ask a question, please? In the creation of the National Socialist State by Hitler, did he not effectively privatise the whole state as his and his board of directors sole control? Was he and the inner party reaping the benefits of ownership of the state? I understand, I think, all you have said, but surely any dictator from whatever political colour is a dictator because they have taken over the state in their private control. Just a thought. Bear with me here, because what I'm about to describe to you is 100% relevant, but in order for me to explain this properly, for the first time on this channel, we have to go right back to the dawn of Western civilization. So, let's do that. In the earliest days of ancient Greece and Rome, you had the family. The concept of the individual had not been created yet. Instead, you were part of your family, and the good that you did, or the bad that you did, impacted the honour or value of your family. Each family had a hearth and a sacred fire. You would offer sacrifices to that fire, because the fire represented both your family and your family's ancestors. Your ancestors, your gods, lived underground as spirits and were embodied in the fire, which is why you would offer the fire food and drink and sacrifices. The fire could not be allowed to go out, as your ancestors were still alive as part of the fire. Honour with worship the chiefs of your country, the dead who live under the earth. The eldest son would succeed the father as the man who tended to the sacred fire and the sacred hearth, and the gods only accepted offerings from the members of your family. The gods, your ancestors, were your family, no one else's family. You must worship them and none others, and no one else could worship your gods unless they were part of your family. Daughters would perform a ritual saying goodbye to her old family, her old ancestors, her old gods, before her old sacred fire. The daughter would no longer be able to worship her old gods anymore, and would no longer be part of her old family. Her new husband would carry her across the threshold of his house, which is a tradition which still carries on to this day, being careful not to touch the sides of the door. He would take her to his hearth, his sacred fire, where a ceremony would welcome her into the new family. The bride, having lost her old gods and family, would now receive new ones, the gods, the ancestors, and the fire of her husband. Once she is married, she cannot return to her old family anymore because she has renounced them forever, even if her new husband dies. As you can probably imagine, the family, not the individual, was the basis of society. A family did not share anything in common with another family. They were completely separate. Even in late Roman times, the houses had to be a minimum of 2.5 feet from each other and could not share a common wall because the gods of the family have to have their own homes. And the sale of property was forbidden, since it wasn't the property of the individual, but the property of the family, 
and of the gods within it. The family had its own customs, laws and traditions. The head of the family, the father, was the head of its own temple. He had absolute authority within the family and even had the right to kill his wife and or children and no other family could stop him. The family did not receive its laws from the city. Private law existed before the city. These families were private families. Privus, meaning single or individual, meant, and still does, a person or belonging to a small group of people that was separate from public life. In a sense, small, independent, private estates rather than large organizations. But families would expand in size, eventually growing to include a few thousand members. These larger families were called gens or gentas, and might be a single line or several branches of the same family, all sharing the same sacred fire or common burial tomb. Each family had its chief, like a little king, and would probably have slaves, which may have had families themselves within the greater family. This is why we have the word gentleman in English. The origin of the word gentle meaning a noble or having the qualities attributed to noble birth comes from the old French gentil, meaning high-born noble, which comes from the Latin gentilis of the same clan. The Athena of the Acropolis of Athens belonged to the family of the Butade. The Potitii of Rome had a Hercules. It appears highly probable that the worship of Venus was for a long time limited to the family of the Julii and that this goddess had no public worship at Rome. Now, while the private domestic religion forbade two families from uniting, it was possible for several families to join together in the celebration of superior gods, which they may find in common. And when a number of families formed this new worship, they called it a fratria in Greek, or curia in Latin. They would raise an altar to a new divinity, one which was higher than the domestic gods, and one which they all had in common, and light a new sacred fire to that being in a new temple. And the Curia, or Fratria, had its own chief, or Curian, or Fratriarch. This new Fratry, where we get the word fraternity from, or brotherhood, had its own laws, customs, gods, worship, priesthood, and government. It was a small society, and when several of these societies joined together, they would create a tribe. This new tribe would also light a new fire at the new altar and do the same, creating laws and traditions. The head of the tribe, the tribunus, would be the king of this society. And when several tribes united together, this new alliance would be the founding of a city, which would adopt its own laws, customs, gods, worship, priesthood, and government. In fact, Rome was supposedly founded by three such tribes. Little by little, the god, gaining more authority over the soul, left the domestic hearth. He had a dwelling of his own and his own sacrifices. The gods of the family with the most prestige would be adopted by the wider society. If we take Athens as an example, this was why Athena was the head of the city. The entire structure of the city was the alliance of multiple families in a hierarchy. This hierarchy united the many private families together. And this 
hierarchy and society was known as the public, or publicus, of the people, or of the state. This public hierarchy was the structure of the central state. This is why today we call the state the public sector, meaning noun, the part of the economy which is controlled by the state. The word public, even to this day, retains the same meaning as the hierarchy of ancient times. From the Oxford English Dictionary, public, adjective 1, of or concerning the people as a whole, 2, open to or shared by all the people of an area or country, 3, of or involved in the affairs of the community, especially in government or entertainment, for, of, or provided by the state, rather than an independent commercial company. There are other words too, which can be used in place of the word public or state. These include words like common, which means adjective belonging to or involving the whole of the community, or the public at large, e.g. common land, Noun, a piece of open land for public use. Or words like society. Noun, one, the aggregate of people living together in a more or less ordered community. Two, the community of people living in a particular country or region and having shared customs, laws and organisations. Three, a specified section of such a community. Or there's group. Noun, a number of people or things that are located, gathered or classified together. Two, a number of people that work together or share certain beliefs. Three, a commercial organisation consisting of several companies under common ownership. Or nation. Noun, a large body of people united by common descent history, culture, or language inhabiting a particular state or territory. The public, the public sector, the nation, the society, the social group, the collective, the common, or commune, whatever. They all mean the same thing, the hierarchy of the public state. At the core of ancient thinking, we have found the assumption of natural inequality. Whether in the domestic sphere, in public life, or when contemplating the cosmos, Greeks and Romans did not see anything like a level playing field. Rather, they instinctively saw a hierarchy or pyramid. Then came Jesus, or at least Paul's interpretation of Jesus as he wrote about him. Prior to this point, you were a member of your family, and your actions were a reflection of your ancestors, your gods, your family, your social group. You were part of your family, your society. You were not an individual. But Jesus died on the cross for your sins. He said, your individual actions will be judged not by your family or society, but by God, and he will judge you alone. You are responsible for your own life, and you will go to heaven or hell based on what you do, not based on what your family or your society does. If another member of your family commits a murder, you don't go to jail for it. You are not guilty by association in the eyes of God. Whether you believe in him or not, Jesus' significance for the history of humanity is profound. This was the invention of the concept of the individual. Every human being is now individually responsible for their own lives. Paul's vision on the road to Damascus amounted to the discovery of human freedom of a moral agency potentially available to each and everyone, that is, to individuals. 
This universal freedom, with its moral implications, was utterly different from the freedom enjoyed by the privileged class of citizens in the polis. The Christ provides a foundation in the nature of things for a pre-social or individual will. Individual agency acquires roots in divine agency. The Christ stands for the presence of God in the world, the ultimate support for individual identity. The private individual is born. Prior to this point, private meant a small group or family-sized unit at the bottom of the hierarchy. And it still does. But now it also meant the individual within that small group or family. An individual who owns his own private tools and private workshop is a private individual. And a small family who own their own business could also be classed as private. But when you rise higher on the hierarchy, you shift from private control to public control. To go public is when a company makes shares available on the stock market for the first time. So a company that goes public is no longer owned by individuals or small families, but is owned collectively by a wider portion of society. Anyone can buy shares in the company. It's private in the sense that your eye may not be able to just walk into its head office and visit the executive bathroom, but it's no longer a private company. It is a public company. It's owned by society as a whole, or at least the part of society which wishes to own a portion of it. It may not be the central state, but it is still a public state. Let me say that again. A public entity may not be the central state, but it may be a mini-state in itself, in competition with the central hierarchy. There can be competing public entities. You, for example, are the private viewer watching this video on YouTube, and I am the private creator. We are the private sector. The public company, YouTube, is above us in the hierarchy. Google is above that, and Alphabet is above that. Alphabet is an internet public state. It is the top of its own hierarchy. It's not the central state, it's not the government of Washington or London, but it is its own state. And it's private in the sense that you or I can't just put our feet up on the CEO's desk. But it is still a public entity because it is a public hierarchy. And it is in competition with the central states for power, which is why they're getting in trouble at the moment over their censorship and election rigging scandals. Both the central state and the internet state are in competition with each other for power. Of course, a public entity may also be part of the central state hierarchy. And a good way to tell is to find out if it gets its money or revenue from the state. Here's why this is important. A private company trades with other private people or entities. This trade, the exchange of goods and services, is called barter. You give me fish, and I'll give you a lump of this shiny metal called gold. However, after a while, lumps of gold and silver were turned into coins, which had a fixed weight and size. It was then possible to start saying things like, This quantity of fish is worth 16 one-ounce gold coins. Therefore, this quantity of fish is worth one pound of gold. 16 ounces is a pound, which is where a pound sterling comes from. The exchange of goods and services by lots of private people and entities is what generates prices. 
We only know the value of whatever it is we buy because of the exchange of goods and services by private individuals. Without the trade of private individuals, without the buying and selling of items in exchange for money or currency, we wouldn't be able to put a price on something. If you're alone on a desert island, how much is a coconut worth in gold or paper? Well, it's not. It has no price value. Okay, yes, it is valuable, but you cannot calculate the price of it because you have no one to agree with you on that price. Only by exchanging goods with other people in a free market can we come to a price. And that price isn't fixed and also varies depending on circumstances. If you're drowning in a river, a glass of water isn't worth much to you. But if you're dying of thirst in a desert, you'd give anything to have a glass of water. Is a bottle of water at the supermarket the same price as the same bottle of water at a motorway service station? No, because you have less access to quantities of water on a long, flat road than you would have if you were at home. So the price is more at a service station than it is at your local shop. Products do not have inherent prices. An apple fell off a tree and hit Newton on the head. If that apple was still around today, you can be sure that people would pay a lot more for that super special apple than they would some random apple in an orchard. Apples are not worth a set price and neither is anything else. The exchange of goods and services between people in different locations with different quantities and differing wants and needs is what gives something its value, its price. We call this concept the subjective theory of value, which was first conceptualized in the late 1800s by economists like Karl Menger. Without private individuals buying and selling goods and services, it would be impossible to calculate the true value of things. It would be impossible to calculate prices. Some authority can arbitrarily order that a bottle of water is worth one dollar. But if it is worth less than that, people wouldn't buy it. Why would you pay for something that's more expensive than it should be? So, there would be massive quantities of unsold bottles of water piled up in warehouses. And if the bottle of water was worth more than one dollar, if the authority had artificially reduced the price in order to appease the people, everyone would rush out and buy more water than they actually needed, since it's on offer. But since there's only a finite number of bottles of water, there will be shortages of bottles of water, and soon you wouldn't be able to find bottles of water anywhere, except for on the free market, where sellers would give you a bottle of water if you paid its true market value, which would be artificially higher than it originally would have been due to the artificial shortage caused by the central authority. Usually, though, authorities don't like free markets, and they ban them, calling them black markets or criminal organizations. Profit indicates to someone that a product is in demand. Viewers want history videos, so I can see there's a demand for history videos. Therefore, I make history videos rather than close combat videos, which is what I started out with. If there was a high demand for pizza, then pizza entrepreneurs will start making more profit, which they'll reinvest into their businesses and be able to boost production of pizzas to fulfill that need. Thus, higher profits indicates higher demand. If you get rid of profits, or if the true value of something is impossible to determine, 
then how would you know what's in demand? How would you know what's economical to produce and what isn't? And what's the most economical way to produce that thing? Is it better to use more labour or more machines? Which machine is more efficient or less costly? How would you know if there's no prices or value? You can't even calculate how costly the electricity is that you're using because there's no price. Private markets create prices which shows demand which can be fulfilled by the market. So, private individuals exchange goods and services. This is called the private market, or the free market. And the way to tell if a social entity or business, a public company, is part of the central hierarchy or not, is to find out if it gets its money or revenue from the state or central hierarchy, rather than the free market. If the highest authority funds it, then it's no longer subject to the rules of the private or free exchange market. So essentially, if it's paid for by the state, it is the state. For example, a private individual gives money to an individual doctor in a building. This building would be a private hospital because it provides patients with health care directly through the exchange of goods and services on the market. If instead the government provides health care by taxing you and giving that money to the doctor indirectly, this would be a public or social healthcare system, because the market for healthcare has been abolished, or at least artificially manipulated. I've had people in the comments of my videos tell me, not so politely, that the National Socialist Health Service in Britain is a private company. This is despite the fact that everyone in the UK, the public, has to pay into the ridiculously expensive, inefficient, and murderously out-of-date system via taxation, which is collected by the state, which then claims it's free. Hmm. That's why I, as a private citizen, can opt out of the National Socialist Health Service. Oh wait, no I can't. Because clearly there's no market and I'm not free to do so. But it's not a real social service or anything like that. By the same token, when the government privatises an industry, but continues to pay for it, it hasn't privatised it at all. As an example, the academy schools in the UK have been called private schools, and the UK government and press have said how they are a great example of how the private sector cannot do education correctly. However, they are not private schools. They are state-funded schools. Yes, they don't follow the National Socialist curriculum, but they are regulated by the state and must do as the state wishes, and they are paid for by the central state, not by private citizens. They are not receiving all their funds directly from the private citizens, meaning they are not on the private market. There's no way to know how efficient they are being, because you cannot generate prices. Yet, that doesn't stop Goebbels' Ministry of Enlightenment criticising them as being expensive to run, even though there's no way to calculate that. Again, they are being funded by the state, and if it's paid for by the state, it is the state. And guess what else is funded by the state? Yes, the BBC. The same BBC which has racial quotas requiring them to recruit people based on the colour of their skin. They judge you by the colour of your skin. They have sex quotas. They judge you by your sex and gender. TV owners in the UK are being forced to pay a tax that funds a racist and sexist state corporation. 
And if it's paid for by the state, it is the state. So yes, the UK government is sexist and racist. The private sector is non-state. Noun. The part of the national economy that is not under direct state control. Or, noun, businesses and industries that are not owned or controlled by the government. When you have a market which is in private control, it is owned by individuals or small groups like families. A private market is also known as a free market because it is free from state control. And capitalism, which is a term made up by the enemies of capitalism to make it sound greedy and evil, is technically defined as the private control of the means of production. It is power to the individuals and small businesses, not the big businesses, not the central banks, and not the public state. Capitalism, noun, an economic and political system in which a country's trade and industry are controlled by private owners for profit rather than by the state. Today, no influential party would dare openly to advocate private property in the means of production. The word capitalism expresses, for our age, the sum of all evil. Capitalism is all about small, independent, private groups or individuals owning their businesses. Emphasis on small, family-like groups and emphasis on individuals. Private enterprise, noun, business or industry that is managed by independent companies or private individuals rather than controlled by the state. A public company is owned by the society as a whole. It is a public hierarchy. To go public. A company that goes public makes shares available on a stock market for the first time, so that the rest of society can buy into it, and thus it is no longer private. Private company. Noun. A company whose shares may not be offered to the public for sale. Capitalism is for private control, small and individual. This is what the word private means. It does not mean the hierarchy. It does not mean big business, or corporations, or central banks, or state. Capitalism is non-state. It is non-corporation. It is against big business. It is against central banking. Because it knows that private businesses cannot grow large naturally. Why? Well, as businesses grow, they find it harder and harder to be internally efficient because there's no exchange of goods and services inside the business. They find it impossible to calculate internal prices. It becomes incredibly difficult for a company like Amazon to know if they are being efficient or not. It's also impossible to have a monopoly under a free market. Monopolies are only possible by government regulation or manipulation. Competition forces businesses to lower prices to attract customers, helping the consumer, but also lowering profits, thus keeping businesses lean and efficient. A giant bloated mess of a corporation is getting killed by small YouTubers like Tim Pool, who's getting similar sorts of daily views on his channel as they are. Competition is bad for big businesses because despite the fact that they have a bigger budget, bigger teams and more expertise, they can't compete with a guy with a camera 
who's doing as good a job, if not better, than they are at delivering the news. If he wasn't, he wouldn't be getting the views. As another example, in the 1800s in America, Commodore Vanderbilt competed with the state-subsidized and regulated monopoly steamship company owned by Fulton. Technically, it was illegal for Vanderbilt to compete with the government's monopoly, but since rules are meant to be broken, he did anyway, undercutting Fulton's monopoly by charging lower prices and being more efficient with his business. Eventually, he cut prices to zero. Yes, zero. He charged nothing to passengers for travelling on his steamboats, making money by selling them things on the boats themselves. This is what capitalism is all about, the idea that left to its own devices, the market will keep things small and cheap. It is all about giving as much power as possible to the small companies and private individuals in society, benefiting the consumer, and limiting or bringing down the big businesses and corporations and states which weigh heavily upon society. It is against the hierarchy, for the benefit of the people at the bottom. It uses profit as a guide. Are the people going hungry through famine? Okay, then there's profit to be made, if only I can figure out a way to put food in the mouths of those people who are hungry. The rest of the hierarchy, the public sector, is built upon the private sector. Without the private sector, the hierarchy has no foundation. There can be individuals without states, but no state without individuals. You know this is true because during regime changes, or the fall of nations, the people live on. The Norman conquest of Britain did not see the Anglo-Saxons, the English, wiped from existence. The English still exist today. The downfall of one public regime and the replacement by another might be bloody, but doesn't necessarily destroy the private foundation. This replacement of a regime is like a wheel. You start at the top, flow around, and come back to where you were. You're not moving anywhere. In fact, in some cases, you're going backwards. You're just replacing the old public state with a new public state. And this is why we call this process of regime change a revolution. Wheel. Revolution. You get it? So, if capitalism sees the need for the private sector to dominate society, what is it called when the public sector dominates society? Well, there's a few different terms. Collectivism. Noun. 1. The practice or principle of giving a group priority over each individual in it. 2. The ownership of land and the means of production by the people or the state as a political principle or system. Or socialism. Noun. A political or economic theory of social organisation which advocates that the means of production, distribution, and exchange should be owned or regulated by the community as a whole. It is the aim of socialism to transfer the means of production from private ownership to the ownership of organised society, to the state. The term communism signifies just the same as socialism. The use of these two words has repeatedly changed during the past decades, but always the question which separates socialists from communists was only political tactics, both aimed to socialize the means of production. Socialism is the socialization of the means of production. And that's just a fancy way of saying that society as a whole, in other words, the public sector hierarchy, is in total control, not the private individuals. 
it doesn't necessarily mean that the central state is the only authority. You could have other public bodies which are in control of certain sectors of the economy as well. Trade unions, for example, also known as syndicates, could dominate society by being another hierarchy, either outside or as part of the central state structure. This is still socialised control of the economy. It's still socialism, just a different form of it. You could also live in a collective or organise society into other public bodies that form their own hierarchies. And just to clarify, the word communism has evolved over time. But prior to Lenin and Stalin, communism and socialism were synonyms of each other. They both meant the same thing. And even now, they both advocate public sector control of the economy. They just want to get there in different ways and rule over society in different ways. But essentially, they mean the same thing. Marx and Engels described their Marxist version of socialism and communism as socialised man, which is the public sector, the associated producers, in other words the workers, rationally regulating their interchange with nature, meaning they're controlling the market and not letting it be free. Bringing it under their common control, bringing it into the hierarchy of public state control, instead of being ruled by it as by the blind forces of nature instead of being ruled by the free market or private market. Capitalism. So, the public sector state, in the name of the workers, is controlling the market, not letting it be free, by bringing all of society into the hierarchy of the public state. But then, some Marxists reject this. They say that their ideology is non-state. They claim that Marx and Engels said that the state would die away and there would be no state left. Instead, you would have a socialist utopia. And Engels does say this in his essay, Socialism, Utopian and Scientific. State interference in social relations becomes, in one domain after another, superfluous, and then dies out of itself. The government of persons is replaced by the administration of things, and by the conduct of processes of production. The state is not abolished, it dies out. So, what Mr Engels is saying here is that once the workers' state has been established, the public hierarchy just dies out and goes away of its own accord. Okay, so let's just accept the idea that once the next Lenin and Stalin are in power, they and their goons will just disappear, even though that will never happen. But let's just accept it. Okay, so the public sector hierarchy just dies away. There it goes. Okay, so what are we left with? The private sector without a state. Anarcho-capitalism. So, that's right, ladies and gentlemen. Marx and Engels were anarcho-capitalists. Or they're lying and trying to trick you into bringing in totalitarianism. Wake up, people. But we know they won't wake up. Anyway, a trade union, also known as a workers' council, in Russian is known as a Soviet. The Soviet Union was the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, the USSR. It was a union of workers' trade union councils. This is the principle of Marxist socialism, or communism. That everything was owned by the public sector. A public sector set up in the name of the workers. Workers were forced into trade unions and gulags and peasants were forced into collective farms, or gulags, resulting in millions of deaths. Why? Because they abolished the free markets, thus preventing the free exchange of goods, meaning 
that there was no way to calculate prices without the prices of independent private people to fulfill the need, there was no incentive to meet demand, and thus the peasants starved. When Lenin got into power in Russia after the October Revolution, which happened in November, one of his first tasks was to get bread from the farms into the cities. But Lenin, like all socialists, believed that profit was theft. Therefore, he ordered the peasants to sell their grain to the state at a fixed price, and then this would be, in turn, redistributed to the people in the cities. Of course, the price Lenin was willing to pay for this grain was lower than what the grain was actually worth, so the peasants decided not to sell it to the government, obviously. Instead, they hopped onto the trains with sacks of grain on their backs and sold the grain directly to the workers in the cities, creating a free market. Lenin wasn't happy with this, calling the free market a black market and ordering these bagmen to be shot. He then ordered that the peasants hand over all their crops which weren't required to feed themselves. If they would not yield it, armed teams of workers and soldiers would be sent to take it by force. So basically, instead of trading their own goods for food, they stole food instead. Lazy people with guns, claiming to be workers, stole food off the people who grew food. And you know they were lazy, because if they had got to work, and had produced something of value which the farmers wanted, they wouldn't have had to resort to stealing. But no, the workers were producing bullets and bombs, things the farmers didn't want, so they had no incentive to sell their food to the cities. There was now a shortage of food in the cities, causing the prices of food to go up, making people hungry. Instead of producing consumer goods that farmers might want, Lenin called for the peasants to sell their food for cheaper prices, giving them no incentive to do so. They then refused, and decided to go behind his back. Then Lenin decided to shoot people who tried to trade for food, bringing a halt to the free market. Thus, the only way to get food was to steal it by gunpoint, which is what they did. Welcome to Utopia. Anyone who refused to hand over their grain was deemed to be a capitalist, and the term kulak, meaning tight-fisted, was applied to describe them. This was during the Russian Revolution, but later, in the 1930s, the Marxist socialist state under Stalin decided to crack down on the peasantry even more, since Marx had called for the improvement of the soil generally in accordance with a common plan in the Communist Manifesto. Well, this improvement could only happen by force. Stalin's five-year plan, the collectivization of agriculture, and the war against the Kulaks resulted in the direct death of somewhere in the region of three or four million Ukrainians through famine, plus more indirectly, more weakened by hunger, and hundreds of thousands more deported to Siberia as slaves. Socialists around the world then say, well, this wasn't real socialism. But it was. The forced collectivization of the peasantry into the public hierarchy, according to the central state's central plan, was done by the public sector. And we know that the public sector is not capitalism, we know that it is socialism. These Marxists, though, claim it was state capitalism. Well, the term state capitalism is an oxymoron. It's a term made up purely to confuse people. It's actually saying public and private at the same time, which is impossible. An entity is either not part of the public hierarchy, or it is. And if it is public, then it's not capitalism. It's socialism. Simple. 
And this is why the term state capitalism was invented to hide the term socialism. If the public sector state is in control, as the phrase implies, state capitalism, then it's socialism, public or social control of the means of production. But the enemies of capitalism want to deceive and confuse people. If they muddy the terms enough so that you don't understand them, you'll give up trying to understand everything and instead turn to the slogans. Slogans like, steal from the rich and give to the poor. Even though Robin Hood stole from the king, who was the state, and gave the money back to the taxpayer, regardless of whether they were rich or poor. But shh, don't tell you that. Liberalism champions private property in the means of production because it expects a higher standard of living from such an economic organisation not because it wishes to help the owners. In the liberal economic system, more would be produced than in the socialistic. The surplus would not benefit only the owners. According to liberalism, therefore, to combat the errors of socialism is by no means the particular interest of the rich. It concerns even the poorest, who would be injured just as much by socialism. Here's another slogan that socialists use to confuse you. Capitalism is for big corporations. But that's simply not true. Again, capitalism is about the private sector, the non-hierarchy parts of society. It is distinctly anti-corporation. In fact, it is the socialists who are pro-corporation. They want government control of the economy. They want central banks, as Marx called for in the Communist Manifesto. They want trade unions and workers' councils, which are corporations. Let me explain. If you have large trade unions which dominate society, something that Marxist syndicalists believe in, you could say that they would embody the nation. If they embody the nation... Embody, body, corpse, corporation, that's where the term comes from, then they would be giant public entities. A central state finds it easier to control a handful of public corporations than it does thousands of small private businesses. So, statists, socialists, who want to control society want a handful of public corporations rather than thousands of small private companies. This is the central idea behind Marxist socialism. And anarcho-syndicalism, or corporatism, or fascism, or national socialism. They all want the public sector to have total control. Total state control. Totalitarian control. The modern roots of the fascist corporate state were revolutionary syndicalism. Socialists want the end of capitalism. They want the end of the private sector. They want everybody to be part of this hierarchy. The body of the nation, the corporation, the corporate state, socialism. With most of you as slaves at the bottom and them in total control at the top. In this utopia for them, there can be no individual who is outside of the state. Everything in the state, nothing outside the state, nothing against the state. Marx called for, one, abolition of property in land and application of all rents of land to public purposes. Two, a heavy progressive or graduated income tax. Three, abolition of all rights of inheritance. Four, confiscation of the property of all emigrants and rebels. Five, centralization of credit in the hands of the state by means of a national bank with state capital and an exclusive monopoly. Six, centralization of the means of communication and transport in the hands of the state. 7. Extension of factories and instruments of production owned by the state. 
the bringing into cultivation of wastelands and the improvement of soil generally in accordance with a common plan. 8. Equal liability of all to work, establishment of industrial armies, especially for agriculture. 9. Combination of agriculture with manufacturing industries, gradual abolition of all the distinction between town and country by a more equable distribution of the populace over the country. And 10. Free education for all children in public schools, abolition of children's factory labour in its present form, combination of education with industrial production, etc. So, a state monopoly on property, a state monopoly on media and transport, a state monopoly on factories and production centres, also known as nationalisation, a central state bank which has a monopoly, state monopoly on education and agriculture, and so on. All within the state, nothing outside of the state. This is why they call for social welfare and social security and social medicine, state regulations, state taxes, state monopolies. If the state ruled the economy, everything would be better, they claim. Gentile, the one who invented fascism, believed that the true state, his ethical state, was a corpus, a body politic, hence corporate state, and that the state was more important than the parts, the individuals, who comprised it because if the state was strong and free, so too would be the individuals within it. Therefore, the state had more rights than the individual. Only within the ethical state could individuals realise themselves as proper individuals, apparently. The great social and constitutional reform that fascism is accomplishing, instituting the cooperative syndicalist regime as a substitute for the liberal state, arose out of the very character of the fascist state. Fascism accepted from syndicalism the idea of the educative and moral function of the syndicate. But, since the intention was to overcome the antithesis between the state and the syndicate, the effort was made to enter the system of syndicates harmoniously, into corporations subject to discipline by the state, and to thereby give expression to the organic character of the state. Blah blah blah. Basically, they were against capitalism, they were against the private sector, and they were against individual freedom, and they were pro-trade union, or syndicate, or corporation, and pro-public sector dominance of society. Their main influence was Marxism, but they can't admit that because most people feared Marxism at the time, so they wanted to distance themselves from the Marxists by calling themselves something else. In the end, calling themselves fascists, and saying that their way was a third way between Marxism and capitalism. In reality, it was just national Marxist socialism, rather than international Marxist socialism. The people is the body of the state, and the state is the spirit of the people. The tools with which the ideal is achieved in the state are the party and the corporation. All must bow to the collective, the worker, the nation, the race, the gender, the group. All must bow to the state. All must bow to the leader. Hence the term Ein Volk, Ein Reich, Ein Führer. One people, one state, one leader. Alternatively, one class, one state, one comrade. Capitalism is not about state control. And it isn't about corporations or any other public entity. It is about the private sector, individuals and small groups at the bottom. It is about giving power to the individual, individual freedom, classic liberalism, not public freedom. Capitalists believe that, left to free market forces, the public sector entities 
will collapse in on themselves. You know this is true, because if the lazy state wasn't able to forcefully collect taxes from those who actually work, then the bloated corpse of the state would expire in an instant. The public sector does not create wealth, it can only dig its claws into the workers and extract wealth from them. Without a private sector, or the ability to forcefully take money from it, the public sector would not be able to sustain itself. The only reason corporations get larger and larger is because the state is propping up the rotten edifice of their businesses. They do this through regulations and minimum wage, both of which hurt small companies more than larger ones. They do this through tax breaks, tariffs on goods, anti-competition laws, and so on. This is why large corporations like YouTube and Twitter aren't making profits, but have somehow survived for years longer than they normally would have done. This is because funds are being artificially funneled into them from external sources, from society as a whole, through public shareholders, or from the public state. They've not earned this revenue legitimately through profit. Instead, they've had money granted to them in the hope that, eventually, they will turn a profit. Now, yes, you could say that this is an investment, but it's clearly a bad investment. I know, let's invest in a company that's not profitable. I'm sure that's a good idea, right? Clearly, the only ones investing in these companies are public investors, and they operate slightly differently. If we invest in something that doesn't work, we lose our money. We can only blame ourselves for not being more careful. But when the state invests our money into something that doesn't work, it cannot admit to us that it made a bad decision, since it wants to get re-elected. So it takes taxes and prints more money, and pumps all that into the project in the hope that it will, somehow, create a profit. This is why states generate huge companies that are internally inefficient, and then props them up, inflating bigger and bigger bubbles of stupidity, until eventually, pop, the bubble bursts. Confidence is lost, the downfall of the inflated bubble, and this is known as a recession, a depression, or a collapse. This process is then used as proof that capitalism is failing. See, capitalism doesn't work. Well, hold on. This wasn't capitalism to begin with. The bubble that burst was artificially created by the public sector, by society as a whole, or by the state. The failure of socialism is being used to blame capitalism. The public sector is failing. See, the private sector doesn't work. Wait, no. The correction to fair value, the reset, the recession, the depression, the crash, all of this is reality catching up on the artificially inflated public sector economy. It is the collapse of the hierarchy of inefficiency and corruption. It is the private sector saying, we can't support this rubbish anymore. It is the unshackling of the chains that held down the private sector, allowing the actual economy to function again once more. This is why living standards increase for those who do retain their private sector jobs during a recession. The public sector is what's failing. Yes, some private companies are latched onto the public sector, and so when that falls, they fall too, but the point is that the collapse comes from the public sector, not the private sector. But socialists don't want to admit this. They don't want the free market to function. They want to retain power. All are socialists who consider the socialistic order of society economically and ethically superior to that based on private ownership of the means of production. So, instead of letting the economy correct itself in a matter of months, like in the Great Depression of 1920, 
yes, there was a depression in 1920, they try and retain their control on the economy, like in the Great Depression of 1929. The 1920 recession lasted 12 months. Why? Because the US government did nothing. The 1929 recession lasted 17 years until 1946. Why? Price controls, wage controls, deficit spending, quantitative easing or dollar intervention, government bonds, government loans, laws and regulations, restricting the free functions of the private market, central bank manipulation of inflation or deflation. It wasn't a free market. And so the private sector free market wasn't allowed to recover from the correction, which is why the US economy didn't recover until 1946, when Roosevelt had died and the shackles came off the economy. See Higgs's Depression, War and Cold War for more information. The same happened recently, which is why the world economy has been at a standstill since 2008, and why we're on the verge of another collapse. The everything bubble, as it is called. It's not the problem of the private sector, it's the fat, beer belly, bureaucratic, public state sector, which isn't working. And it's about to crash again. And it will keep on crashing again and again, and we'll keep getting hangovers until people decide to learn from history, until people realise that the public sector is the problem, the cancer of society, and decide to sober up. Some people genuinely believe that a strong public sector, a strong collective, a strong nation, a strong society, is what is needed to solve all our problems. Because the answer to the problems of the current state is a revolution which brings in another state. The problem of the old aristocratic regime can be cured by the French Revolution and the dictatorship of Napoleon. The problem of the Tsarist state can be cured by the Leninist state or the Stalinist state. The problem of the Kaiserreich can be cured by the Weimar Socialist Democratic State, which in turn can be cured by the National Social State. The problems of the current authoritarian state can be cured by our, insert totalitarian, regime ideology here, state. They're not interested in anything other than power. They want more public sector monopoly control, and they want to be in charge of it. And that is all. We call these people socialists, and they belong on the left of the political spectrum. The leftists believe in strong centralization. The leftist is always a statist. Other people believe that the problem is the public sector itself. They call for the limitation of government power, for a voluntary tax system rather than force, or the abolition of government altogether. They want more private sector control, and we call these people right-wing libertarians or classic liberals, and they belong on the right of the political spectrum. The right has been identified with personal freedom, with the absence of utopian visions. It stands for free, organically grown forms of life. Some people believe that anarchism is on the left. There are anarcho-syndicalists and anarcho-communists who call for the abolition of the current state, and then start talking about a new, utopian, federal state, which is apparently classed as anarchism in their minds. Really? Anarchists want public, collective state control, do they? They want a federal system, do they? No, they want the opposite. They want to get rid of the public hierarchy in favour of private individual freedom. Anarchism, in the leftist sense, is, just like the term state capitalism, an oxymoronic term. You can't have socialist anarchism. They're directly contradictory. Socialism is state. Anarchism is non-state. This is why, if you watch any videos by anarcho-syndicalists, the whole thing is a mess of contradictions and doublethink. We're anarchists who want giant corporations that we call syndicates. Yeah, real revolutionaries. 
Others say that National Socialists and the Fascists are on the right and are capitalists. Really? These people genuinely think that Fascists and Nazis don't want a strong leader or a strong state which is in totalitarian control. They genuinely believe that Fascists and Nazis don't promote collective racial or national control, but instead promote individual freedom and free trade. Clearly, that's not the case. Hitler makes it blatantly clear that he hates capitalism and free markets, which he associates with the Jews. The internationalization of our German economic system, that is to say, the transference of our productive forces to the control of Jewish international finance, capitalism, can be completely carried out only in a state that has been politically Bolshevized. But the Marxist fighting forces, commanded by international and Jewish stock exchange capital, cannot finally smash the national resistance in Germany without friendly help from outside. Yes, Hitler hates both capitalism and Marxist socialism because, in his mind, both of these two ideologies were created by the Jews in a giant conspiracy to bring down civilization. As Zeitelman points out, contrary to the accepted Marxist interpretation, Hitler was not an opponent of Marxism and did not want to destroy it because he was inimical to labour, but because he was caught up in the insane idea that Marxism was an instrument of the Jews for the achievement of world domination and above all because he rejected internationalism, pacifism, and the negation of the personality principle by Marxism. The primary reason why Hitler was against Marxism was because he thought Marxism was Jewish. Let that one sink in. But clearly, Nazis and fascists are for a strong, public sector, and thus are on the left of the political spectrum, and are socialists. National socialism should not be primarily interpreted as anti-Marxism. It was, rather, an alternative, competing, revolutionary movement which did not have the destruction of Marxism as its main objective, but which had to destroy it not despite, but because of its proximity to it. The vast majority of the leftist ideologies now dominating or threatening most of the modern world are competitors rather than enemies. This, we think, is an important distinction. When the totalitarian wave started, the old liberals were persecuted in a sense more bitterly than the people on the left. Those on the left, socialists, communists, and Jacobin democrats, were totalitarian competitors, not mutual enemies. The social democratic worker in Essen and the socialist worker in Sesto San Giovanni, or in Turin, could very easily switch sides. The worker in Essen gave up international socialism and embraced national socialism. The directors of his factory were now mere stewards of the state. The worker in Turin knew that Benito Mussolini had been a socialist, and that the fascist movement had grown out of Italian socialism, shedding first of all its international outlook. And they are not the only ones to think that fascists and national socialists are competitors with the Marxist international socialists. The world is split today into two hostile camps, fighting each other with the utmost vehemence, communists and anti-communists. The magniloquent rhetoric to which these factions resort in their feud obscures the fact that they both perfectly agree 
in the ultimate end of their program for mankind's social and economic organization. They both aim at the abolition of private enterprise and private ownership of the means of production, and at the establishment of socialism. They want to substitute totalitarian government control for the market economy. No longer should individuals by their buying or abstention from buying determine what is to be produced and in what quantity and quality. Henceforth, the government's unique plan alone should settle all these matters. Paternal care of the welfare state will reduce all people to the status of bonded workers bound to comply without asking questions with the orders issued by the planning authority. Neither is there any substantial difference between the intentions of the self-styled progressives and those of the Italian fascists and the German Nazis. The fascists and the Nazis were no less eager to establish all-round regimentation of all economic activities than those governments and parties which flamboyantly advertise their anti-fascist tenants. It is a matter of dispute whether, prior to the middle of the 19th century, there existed any clear conception of the socialist idea, by which is understood the socialization of the means of production, with its corollary, the centralized control of the whole of production by one social, or more accurately, state organ. The answer depends primarily upon whether we regard the demand for a centralized administration of the means of production throughout the world as an essential feature in a considered socialist plan. The older socialists looked upon the autarky of smaller territories as natural and, on any exchange of goods beyond their frontiers, as at once artificial and harmful. Only after the English free traders had proved the advantages of an international division of labour and popularised their views through the Cobden movement, did the socialists begin to expand the ideas of village and district socialism into a national and, eventually, a world socialism. Even Hitler said that they were competitors, which is why he emphasizes their differences over and over. The racial Weltanschauung worldview is fundamentally distinguished from the Marxist by reason of the fact that the former recognizes the significance of race, and therefore also personal worth, and has made these the pillars of its structure. If the National Socialist Movement should fail to understand the fundamental importance of this essential principle, if it should merely varnish the external appearance of the present state and adopt the majority principle, it would really do nothing more than compete with Marxism on its own ground. For that reason, it would not have the right to call itself a Weltanschauung worldview. If the social program of the movement consisted in eliminating personality and putting the multitude in its place, the National Socialism would be corrupted with the poison of Marxism, just as our national bourgeois parties are. All must be part of the National Socialist State rather than the Marxist Socialist State. In its organization, the state must be established on the principle of personality, starting from the smallest cell and ascending up to the supreme government of the country. All must submit to the public sector state, the collective, the people's state. But of course, once the public sector is in control, the people don't really have much of a say. The people's state will classify its population in three groups, citizens, subjects of the state, and aliens. The public sector is in total control, so you, the individual, must bow to the collective. If you happen to be out of favour with the establishment, if you happen to be a capitalist, a kulak, or a Jew, 
you're going to have a bad time, as the full might of the hierarchy of hate weighs heavily upon you, fighting to eliminate you from existence. Concentration camps, or gulags, are not a free market. They are made by one thing, and one thing only. The state. In order to create them, the state must control the economy. Both governments, Nazi and Marxist, reorganized industry into larger units, ostensibly to increase state control over economic activity. The Nazis reorganized industry into 13 administrative groups, in other words corporations, with a large number of subgroups to create a private hierarchy for state control. Which means it's not privately controlled, Temin, but I digress. The state, therefore, could direct the firm's activities without acquiring direct ownership of enterprises. Let me read that again. The state, therefore, could direct the firm's activities without acquiring direct ownership of enterprises. State control does not require ownership. The pre-existing tendency to form cartels was encouraged to eliminate competition that would destabilize prices. The Soviets had made a similar move in the 1920s. Faced with a scarcity of administrative personnel, the state encouraged enterprises to combine into trusts and trusts to combine into syndicates, corporations. These large units continued into the 1930s, where they were utilized to bridge the gap between overall plans and actual production. And this is where people go wrong in their thinking. People have screamed at me in the comment sections of my videos, telling me that Hitler was a capitalist. So in their minds, Hitler was against the public sector, the state hierarchy, and was for the little guy, the small, independent, private individuals and families. And this is where their logic breaks down. It makes no sense. For example, here is a user known as the Finnish Socialist. He says, Socialism is and has been defined as social ownership of the means of production, and is opposed to private ownership of the means of production. Okay, glad to see we're in agreement with that. Socialism is against individuals who want control of their own economy. It doesn't want the workers to own their own tools, which is capitalism. It calls for the social or public sector ownership of those tools, state control. This is not only from a Marxist point of view either. True. There are many versions of socialism, since there are many different types of states, including fascist socialist Italy and national socialist Germany. But then he says, Why Nazi Germany wasn't socialist is fairly obvious. They did mass privatization programs. Hell, even the word privatization was invented because of them. Except, they didn't mass privatize anything. The word privatization was coined by them. But, just like the British media and government say that academic schools are private, seizing property and businesses off private owners and selling them to members of the National Socialist Party, which was the state, and retaining control over them by bringing those businesses under syndicate corporate control, isn't privatization. In practice, the Reichsbank and the Reich Ministry of Economic Affairs had no intention of allowing the radical activists of the SA, the shop floor militants of the Nazi party, or Gauleiter commissioners to dictate the course of events. Under the slogan of the strong state, the ministerial bureaucracy fashioned a new national structure of economic regulation. The National Socialist Party walked into the businesses and took them over from within. They nationalized and socialized the industries 
and called that privatization. Well, it wasn't privatization. Everything was brought under state control. And what's interesting is that the international socialists are quick to point out that just because socialism is in the name of national socialism doesn't mean it's socialism. They say you can't take the Nazis at their word. True. I 100% agree. You can't take the Nazis at their word. So, when they say they privatise the industries, don't take them at their word. They didn't. But, continuing to talk about something he hasn't done any research on, the Finnish socialist goes on. Nazi Germany was a totalitarian state capitalist system. Right, so the public hierarchy had total control of the economy, which is why it was a totalitarian state, but the economy was private, and thus not under totalitarian control. Again, this is a direct contradiction of reality. It's either the state, or it's not the state. If it's capitalism, the private sector, then it is non-state. If it is non-state, then it cannot be a totalitarian state, because the private citizens are not controlled by the state. The words he used should read, National Socialist Germany was a totalitarian state socialist system. Let's read on. The capitalist mode of production was prevalent. There was lots of small businesses independent of the state, was there? Well, I guess National Socialist Germany definitely wasn't a totalitarian regime then. Also, let's just ignore all the independent capitalist Jewish businesses which got smashed up, stolen, and Aryanized by the public sector state. Yes, let's just ignore that completely. The life of the German businessman is full of contradictions. He cordially dislikes the gigantic, top-heavy bureaucratic state machine which is strangling his economic independence. Yet he needs the aid of these despised bureaucrats more and more, and is forced to run after them, begging for concessions, privileges, grants, in fear that his competitor will gain the advantage. Yes, definitely sounds like a free market to me. Then he says, unions were abolished. No, they weren't. Private unions were absorbed into the DAF, the German Labour Front, because all unions had to be brought under control of the state. In other words, unions were nationalised and socialised, which is exactly what Marxist socialists want. The Soviet Union did the same thing. That's why the workers' trade unions, or councils, or Soviets, were the state. That's why they called it the Soviet Union, the Workers' Council Union. But when the Soviet Union does it, they call it socialism. But when the Third Reich does it, they call it capitalism. No contradiction there at all. In reality, the private unions were absorbed into the state union. Therefore, this is an example of how the Third Reich brought the unions into social ownership which, as you say, is socialism. But because Finnish socialist cannot comprehend this, he just denies it ever happened. To continue. And the workers had to succumb to the state. Yes, exactly. The workers have been socialised or absorbed into the state. Everyone is in the state. Social or public ownership of the means of production. Everyone is part of the hierarchy. We all must bow down to the collective. So, you saying this is, by your own words, an admission that the National Socialist regime was socialist. But, because he does not understand the difference between the public and private sectors of society, he does not see the contradictions in his own words. Also, if the workers are controlled by the state, they're no longer part of the private sector, meaning this isn't capitalism. This contradicts what he said earlier. The irony is that Mr. Finnish Bolshevik here 
probably wants the workers to own their own tools in some sort of utopia. He wants the poor to be better off by owning their own factories. Well, this utopia he is envisioning, where the workers are owning their own tools, is called capitalism. In capitalism, the workers can own their own tools. In fact, that is exactly what capitalism is, the private individual's ownership of his means of production. The individual owns his own tools. But if everything is owned by the collective, then the workers don't own their own tools. Instead, the collective owns the tools. And the collective is the state. But again, socialists haven't figured this out yet. Worse, they come up with nuggets of doublethink like this one. Even if National Socialist Germany wouldn't have had markets, which they did, that doesn't mean that the system isn't capitalist. So basically, he's saying that if the free market capitalism didn't exist, it would still be classed as capitalism. Honestly, sometimes it boggles the mind. I look at these comments and wonder if these people have ever had an independent thought in their life. The Borg Collective has told me to say that the moon is made of cheese. Therefore, the moon is made of cheese. Herpy derpy derp derp. And they get so angry when I point out the blatant contradictions in their comments. Which is what I'm doing here. For starters, Mr. Finn Sock, one of the reasons, perhaps the central reason, Hitler went to war was because he didn't believe in trade. And he didn't believe in trade because of the socialist concept of the shrinking markets, which I've covered in the shrinking markets videos. So Hitler shut the entire economy down, preventing trade in the hope of becoming self-sufficient. This was his autarky policy and his four-year plan policy of converting the Third Reich into a vampire barter economy, as Gunter Reimann makes clear. They implemented import and export controls, reverted to barter, had wage controls, price controls, heavy taxes, regulations, quotas, and so on and so forth. So, no, they didn't have markets. The entire economy was controlled by the central state, and such an economy is called a socialist economy. But, just like Mises said, it's impossible to calculate prices under such conditions, and the entire economy was so inefficient it ground to a halt, as shown throughout Ali's Hitler's Beneficiaries. I could literally quote the entire book, because it shows exactly how the Third Reich's public hierarchy state had to go to war before its economy devoured itself, and it only managed to stave off economic collapse by resorting to a barter-like economy and exporting inflation to the conquered territories of Europe. It's a brilliant read. Please read that book. I highly recommend it. But we're still not done with Big Bolshevik here. It may not be laissez-faire, sure, so, to explain, laissez-faire means leave alone. It means that the government will leave the economy alone, letting the market do its thing, and allowing free trade with other countries, without tariffs, and things like that. So here, he's saying it wasn't a laissez-faire or leave alone economy, which means he's admitting it wasn't capitalism because, in his own words, the economy is controlled by the state. Again, the double think is just insane, but let's read the full quote. It may not be a leave alone economy, sure, but that doesn't mean that the state itself cannot capitalize on other people's labor and that products are not chiefly sold for profit. Okay, so the problem here is that Finsock is relying on the Marxist misinterpretation of capitalism. In a nutshell, Marxists believe that hiring someone else to work for you and paying them for that work is capitalism and 
even though they have volunteered to work for you and have agreed to the wage and can always leave and go live in the woods or something, it's also exploitation. In their mind, the reason it's exploitation is because of the labour theory of value. This is the idea that a product gains its value based on how many hours it took to make it. So if it took you five hours to make a pile of mud, that pile of mud is worth five hours of wages. And if you happened to find a diamond on the floor, the diamond is worth nothing because you didn't put any effort into making it. Since everything has a set value, you cannot charge higher than the value. A car that took 10 hours to make is worth 10 hours wage. You cannot sell it higher than that. So the only way for anyone to make a profit is to pay the workers less than their worth. So let's say that you slave away for 10 hours to make a car and the evil factory owner sells that car for $100. That means that your wage should be $10 per hour. But the evil factory owner can't pay you $100 because he wants profit. So instead, he gives you $20 for a rate of $2 per hour and pockets the other $80, which is his profit. So under the labor theory of value, the evil factory owner makes evil profit by paying you less than your worth. The problem, of course, is that goods are subjective in value. The subjective theory of value came after Marx wrote Das Kapital. And without the labour theory of value to prop it up, Marxism basically loses its entire substance. Under the subjective theory of value, you may slave away for 10 hours to make a car which could get sold for $20,000 or not sold at all. Either way, you get paid for the hours you agreed to work building the car, regardless whether the car is sold or not. And regardless whether the owner makes a profit or not, you still get paid. He's taking the risk with his business, you are not. And if you don't like your job, Nothing is stopping you from walking out of the doors and finding a better paying job or make your own car factory or your own business. Nothing says you have to work for anybody else. Save up some money from your wages, become self-employed and see how the world really works. But yes, this whole idea that hiring someone is exploitative is just a ridiculous and outdated view of how the economy works. The criticism that Finsock here is trying to deliver is that the National Socialist State exploited people, thus it cannot be socialist. Except that's a meaningless statement, since exploitation cannot happen in a free market. If you agree to work for somebody else, you have not been exploited. You've made, you may have made a bad deal, but that's your own daft fault. You're not being exploited. You can always leave or go live in the woods or whatever. But if you want to be part of society, you need to contribute to society. And the way you contribute to society is by getting some bloody work done. Real exploitation is when you don't have a choice, like being forced to bow down to the whims of the public state, regardless of whether or not you want to. Being forced into collective farms, or forced to join a trade union, or forced to hand over part of your, or all of your wages, or forced to give up your home and possessions, or forced into the ghettos, gulags, or concentration camps. The public sector can decree by law that you must comply with the public sector slave masters, and it can do that democratically as well as by dictatorship. If the majority of society votes and decides to take away all your possessions, that's exploitation. 
You having the freedom to work for somebody else and choosing to do so is not exploitation because you can always leave. It's a free market and free society. You are free to leave it. So Mr. Finsock thinks that exploitation only occurs when it's capitalism, without knowing what capitalism actually is, and thinking that under socialism there would be no exploitation. This is not an argument. Profit is irrelevant. Nothing says that under socialism the public sector state cannot generate a profit. The reality is it can't generate a profit by itself, since it gets its wealth by stealing it from the private sector. But that doesn't mean that, if it did generate a profit, it suddenly wouldn't be socialist. That's just a bad argument. And there's tons of arguments just like this as proof that National Socialism and Fascism weren't public sector control of society, and thus not leftist. Most of these are made by double thinkers who haven't studied history or don't know the difference between the public sector and the private sector, or have no idea what the definitions of capitalism and socialism actually are, or ignore the contradictions in their own statements, or resort to smearing and slander campaigns in order to shame their enemies and mass downvote videos with multiple bogus accounts in the hope that people will stop listening to them. The fact that their insults are about as paper-thin as their arguments should be an indication that they've lost the debate, but we'll see what they say to this video. So, going back to the original question from John Hargreaves, Hitler definitely reaped the benefits of having total control of the economy. His goons also benefited from the ownership of the state. But the state is the public sector, not the private sector. It's private in the sense that Joe Bloggs can't just walk into Hitler's mountain retreat. But the state is not private, it's public. If it's under state control, it's under public control. Hope that answers your question. Now, a few people have pointed out that there's a contradiction in the hitler Weltanschauung quote that I've given a few times now. That is true, and I've been meaning to explain it, but I've had to tackle this and other topics first. Turns out that there's an inherent contradiction within all socialist ideologies, but in National Socialism it is blatantly obvious. So I'll be covering that in the near future. If you're interested in learning more about the ancient world and the way the concept of individuals became a thing, check out the book Inventing the Individual. And no, this isn't a sponsored video, I just think it's a great book. Thanks for watching, bye for now.